pleasure to have every one of you for our fourth webinar conducted by semba sempa alumni of the open university of sri lanka for the benefit of uh, the members who are benefit of the numbers who are joined it's my duty to explain what is this semba sempa semba sempa is uh, the commonwealth executive uh, master of business administration and master of public administration uh, we have already conducted uh, three webinars uh, the committee decided that we should have a knowledge sharing platform and as a result uh, we, uh, we we are sharing knowledge on dis different disciplines with our membership and all interested parties uh, we are fortunate to have very eminent uh, industry experts for the today's uh, program i'm sure the program is going to be very very fruitful and with us we have the dean of the faculty uh, professor uh, as well and now i will invite our president mr indrika to welcome the participants thank you ajit good evening ladies and gentlemen the chief guest today professor v sivalokathasan dean of the management faculty of open university of sri lanka guest of honor dr champika liyanagamage chief coordinator of sempa sempa program professor nali nabesekara and the faculty members and academia of the management faculty professor asoka nugavela our distinguished presenter today dr prasad dharmasena mr bhatia kulumulla <laughs> our eminent panelists mr ajit de silva our executive council member and our session chair today dr sridharan our immediate past president our vice presidents ms vindya jayasena and dr dhananjay dharmaratna secretary to the association mr indika vijayaratna and our liaison officer mr sisil pereira and all our exco members of the alumni my dear fellow members of sempa sempa alumni invitees students and all other participants and guests who are logged in to the session today on behalf of the alumni i would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for today's event and highly appreciate your interest shown in now to participate to the seminar despite your busy schedules it is a positive sign to observe that the society is getting back on its feet with adhering to safety guidelines it seems that we have now identified the ways and the means of tackling the challenges faced due to the pandemic and overcome its impact our alumni have been conducting sessions via zoom and other electronic platforms as cpd development events for its members for some time now and today's program would be such an event in which we attempt to discuss the contribution from the plantation sector to the economy this program was scheduled as a result of the demand by our members to conduct a session on salient factors affecting our country's economy during the challenging times agriculture being one of the industries which with a positive outlook at present was selected by the organizing committee as a timely topic to discuss given the support extended by many stakeholders in the economy however it is also one of the main industries which is been subject to number of deliberations due to the challenges faced by the community engaged in the activities during the recent past hence i hope our audience will have many queries made from the eminent panel who we have invited and would be a very thought provoking session today we as alumni have been have believed that conducting such programs to upbring the knowledge of our members and the society is one such giveaway to the country out of the knowledge we have gained while at the university my sincere appreciation also is extended to the organizing committee for the support extended in arranging this program 
in addition we have lined up many such events and csr projects by the alumni and would like to cordially invite you to keenly participate in those activities just to touch upon one such csr project that ongoing would be to provide ppp packs for the health workers who are constantly supporting to keep us all safe and healthy without further ado i would like to invite all of you to actively participate in today's event and also take back points discussed and be applied in your organization maybe either by a investor or by a employee who will ultimately support support the country's overall objectives of economic development have a fruitful evening and stay safe, stay safe and healthy over to you ajit thank you very much enrico for sharing the objectives and what the alumni does uh, it's a new normal so we have uh, we are unable to meet but it's best that as indika says we share our knowledge today we have selected this very important uh, topic considering the uh, importance of uh, the plantation sector as given to the national economy uh, now i would like to invite today our guest of honor dr champika liana gamage senior lecturer at uh, open university and the course coordinator uh, to share her views at this occasion doctor dr champika yes uh, thank you rajit rajit uh, very good evening to all of you uh, here are the guest of uh, the chief guest uh, professor vc velavadasan the dean of the faculty of management studies uh professor uh, nalin abrasekara uh and other professors the distinguished panel members uh members of semba semba alumni association uh, my dear colleagues and guests uh, on behalf of the faculty of management studies of the open university of sri lanka i'm honored to be here today to speak a few words uh to this valuable event so i'm not taking uh many of the much of your time i'll be taking only very few minutes to uh address you uh, first of all uh i would like to thank uh, semba semba alumni association uh i would say one of the most active alumni association uh, of the open university uh, for the idea to hold this uh, event on a very timely topic today the webinar is one of the series of webinars uh, organized by our alumni as a part of their ppd continuing professional development program uh, with the aim of sharing knowledge to enhance our understanding on various aspects of our life i really appreciate today's event uh, due to uh, two distinguished reasons first uh, due to its importance on continuing uh, professional development ppd or uh, continuing professional development uh, essentially ensures that you continue to be proficient and competent in your profession while also furnishing you with essential skills that could help you progress with your career it's not just one one stop shop either it continues and develops throughout your career so uh, i believe today's session will be adding more meaningful insight to your professional development my second reason for appreciation is today's topic this is indeed indeed a pivotal time to talk about the plantation sector as an investment and uh, more importantly talk about how to strengthen our economy through the opportunities in the plantation sector the decision that we make now will be crucial in both the short and long run development of the economy you have selected the right experts as speakers today so i strongly believe today's session going to be a very interesting as well as eye opening session for all the participants i'm not going to take your valuable time to talk much about the topic neither i'm proficient enough to talk uh, i will hand over to yachit for the proceedings on behalf of the faculty of management studies once again i wish you all the success for today's event as well as uh, all uh, your future events thank you thank you dr shankar you have been a tower of strength to us 
and Northern University has been very helpful to us, including our VC and the dean and all the staff. And uh, you are behind us when whenever we whatever activities we carried out. As you said, the topic is very important, and we have selected some of the eminent uh, professionals in the industry. Though you see the professionals are from the same industry, but they are disciplines are quite different because they come with a different background. May I now outline the uh, webinar proper? We have a presentation from Professor Nugavela, and then uh, we will give 10 minutes each to our two panelists. Then, then we will go to the Q&A. Uh, if you, the participants have any questions, you are kindly requested to uh, for, uh, give your questions through our chat box. Then we will uh, take the questions at the Q&A time. And a kind request to each and every uh, participant to keep your mics muted to prevent any disruptions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, our presenter, well-known personality in the plantation sector and in the academia. Emirate Professor Asoka Nugavela is a senior agriculture scientist, an academic and a consultant in the plantation crops. Uh, Professor Nugavela graduated from University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka with an honors degree in botany in 1979. And following a short stint in uh, teaching at the botany department of university, joined the Robert Research Institution RRI of Sri Lanka in 1980 as a junior scientist. Later, he obtained his full training as a research scientist in the United Kingdom, completing an MSc at the University of London, 82, 1982, and a doctorate in plant productivity and university at, at the University of Essex in 1989. Professor Nugavela worked at the Rubber Research Institute in Sri Lanka over a period of 30 years from the time he first joined as a young scientist in 1980. To his resignation from his post of Director Institute in 2010, he rose to become the Head of Plant Science Department 1991, Deputy Director of Research 2000, and then he was appointed to the post of Director in 2006. While at the RRISL, he served as a Director of several boards in the sector. He also served on the editorial committee of the journals published by the Robert Research Institution of Malaysia and India. His expertise also enabled him to serve as a consultant to the projects both in Sri Lanka and abroad, funded by agencies such as World Bank and Japan International Cooperation Agency. Uh, in 2011, he joined the Faculty of Agriculture Plantation Management via University of Sri Lanka as a chair professor of the Department of Plantation Management. He has allowed him, to, him not only to teach undergraduates, but also to continue his research and consultancy work on both rubber and oil palm crops. He retired from the post of chair professor, faculty of agriculture and plantation management of Vibe University of Sri Lanka in March, 2019. Currently is serving for Lalan Rubber as a director technical. He's a member of the board of Kegol Plantations as well. His research and plantation experiences nationally and uh, has been nationally recognized and Professor Nugala the recipient of many national awards in recognition of his expertise and experience as a scientist. This, this includes the President's Award in 2012 for the best invention in the technology of environment, the National Science and Technology Award 2010 for the category development of eco-material, eco-friendly process for industry. The Presidential Research Award 2001, 2007, 2012 for the contribution to the reputation of the country in a wide context of global advancement of science and human knowledge. To date, he has published more than 175 scientific publication has obtained two uh, patents for the technological innovation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I took all this time to uh, give a brief introduction about the professor. It is nothing but fair for us to give such a recognition to him for the service he has rendered to the entire country. Uh, there are so many other achievements, but I'm not going to extend all these, I mean, share all these uh, achievements. Uh, now I cordially invite Professor Nugavela to do his presentation. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Ajit, uh, for those kind words. And uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, let me uh, thank 
the alumni of Faculty of Management, Open University of Sri Lanka, uh, for the opportunity given to me, and uh, the senior academics of Open University of Sri Lanka, the panelists, and uh, all the participants at the webinar today. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, this topic that had been assigned to me uh, is on the plantation sector of Sri Lanka, uh, more specifically uh, opportunities to strengthen the national economy. And I have shared my presentation and I hope uh, it's visible to all of you all. Yes, Professor. Okay, yes. thank you, Rajit. Yeah, a brief history about the plantation sector or the plantation industry in Sri Lanka, uh, the famous coconut crop that had existed in our country historically uh, from the seventh century AD. Uh, then in the 19th century, the introduction of uh, plantation crops to our country commenced uh, with coffee being introduced in the 19th century. And then subsequently, in 1867, James Taylor, he introduced the tea plant to our country. And that was the beginning of the tea industry. Nine years later, in 1876, uh, Sir Henry Wickham introduced uh, 1,700 rubber seedlings collected from Amazon forest to Sri Lanka. So that was the beginning of the rubber industry. And more recently, uh, oil palm was introduced in 1968 by Mr. Jerry Wells. And the, it was planted in Gaul in the Nakia Deni estate. So these are the main crops that we plant as plantation crops in our country. And this is how they were introduced to our country. So this is our famous coconut, our coffee. Coffee, of course, after a short spell in our country, uh, the industry got wiped out because of a leaf disease. And it didn't thrive in our country for a long period of time. Tea, it exists here even now, rubber, and then a palm oil. Uh, if you take the uh, management of the plantation industry in the country, uh, we could broadly divide the plantation sector into two categories based on the extent of the plantation. Uh, extends uh, below 20 hectares or 50 acres, they are categorized as small holders, small scale growers, and uh, extends larger than that, they are referred to as the plantation sector of the plantation industry or the individual uh, plantations are referred to as estates. So basically, based on the extent, the plantations, whatever the crop, is uh, categorized either as smallholders or plantation based on the extent, land extent. Now, the management of the smallholders, right from the commencement up to now, it's managed by the owner, owner of the land. But uh, it's not the case when it comes to the plantation sector. It underwent uh, a number of changes with regard to its management. Uh, initially, as you all know, the plantations were owned by foreign companies, mainly the British companies. And then in 1970s, uh, based on a policy decision of the then government, all the foreign companies were nationalized. And then they were brought under two corporations, JEDB, SLSPC, JDB standing for Janata Estates Development Board, SLSPC, Sri Lanka State Plantation Corporation. So all the estates 
managed by the foreign companies were brought under these two uh, main uh, corporations. And the objective obviously was to uh, development of the plantations for optimizing production and profitability. That was the objective. Again, in 1992, based on the policy of then government, the policy of liberalization of the economy, uh, the plantations managed by JDB and SLSPC, they were transferred uh, to private companies, 22 private companies in 1992. It was initiated and then it was finalized in 1994. And uh, that's the current management structure from 1992 to 53 years. So the lease, the estates, the government owned land have been leased to the 22 plantation management companies. So this lease agreement will end in year 2045. So until 2045, all our plantations in the plantation sector, not the small rollers, will be managed by the 22 plantation management companies. You call them plantation management companies or regional plantation companies. Right. Uh, just prior to the privatization, uh, the plantation sector, uh, it contributed to the economy of our country in many ways. Uh, first of all, it occupied about 9,000 hectares, 900,000 hectares, which accounts to about 41% of the cultivated land area of the country at that time. And then it also contributed to one third of export earnings, the plantation sector. And uh, it generated 15 to 20% of the budgetary revenue to the country one third of export earnings, about 20% of the income to the government. And then it provided employment to about one sixth of the workforce in our country. And uh, these statistics were obtained by the Plantation Restructuring Unit, the Ministry of Finance, they have a publication. So I got this information through that. Also, uh, the issues prevail uh, under government management, under the management of the JDB and SLSPC. Uh, of course, the, it was not a very smooth running, smooth management. There are issues. And the issues that were identified were the unmanageable size of the two corporations. The two corporations had to manage more than 100,000 hectares. So that was one issue that prevailed at that time. And then be, maybe because of the high, uh, the extent, the accountability at that time had been an issue. And then the bureaucratic and the centralized system of planning and control, uh, two companies, two corporations managing a large extent of land. And then shortage of specialized skilled people to manage the plant plantations was another issue identified. And poor overall performance of the plantation sector at that time. These were some of the shortcomings identified under the state management of the plantation sector of our country. So therefore, the government, the then government with the policy of uh, liberalization of the economy, uh, they thought of privatizing and handing it over to the 22 plantation management companies. And they are uh, what the government uh, thought of handing over uh, to the private management was to achieve uh, or to provide the, a good business environment to the plantation sector, a conducive environment uh, to carry out business in the plantation industry, to make all the plantations uh, efficient, to have an efficient management system in the individual estates. That was another objective of the privatization. And then through that increasing productivity, profitability, another objective, and overall 
enhancing the contribution to the national economy because uh, the plantation sector was referred to as the backbone of the economy of our country. So government laid a lot of emphasis on the plantation sector at that time. Uh, we'll briefly look into the performance of the tea sector. And uh, I have collected this data uh, from the central bank reports and also the Ministry of Plantation and Industry annual reports. What I'm trying to do here is to take plantation sector initially, the tea sector, and compare the key performance indicators in 1991, just prior to privatizing, with the current scenario, 2018. So if we take uh, different KPIs, if we take the extent, uh, in 1991, we have been having uh, 222,000 hectares of tea, but now it had come down to 2,000 hectares. Uh, the growth percentage, how I calculated this figure was, I took this variance, uh, 2018 figure minus 1991 figure. I got that variance, divided it by the number of years in between, which is 27 years. So that will give us an average annual uh, growth, either positive or negative. So that's the system which I adapted to calculate this figure for all these KPIs. So the extent, yeah, it's a negative growth of 0.4% each year from the base figure of 1991 from the base figure of 1991. Uh, the production, there's a positive growth, 1%, 1% when comparing it 1991 figure, annually, there's a 1% increase in growth of production, sorry, the production. And pr land productivity, we calculated or we determined the land productivity of plantations in terms of kilograms of the produce, per hectare, that's the unit land area per annum. That's how we uh, uh, calculate or assess the land productivity in the plantation sector. In 1991, it had been 1,084, and 2018, it had gone up to 1,594, uh, average mean growth rate of about 1.7%. The contribution to the national income 1991, 17,866 million rupees. And here today, it had gone up to 231 million rupees. Growth rate of 44.3%. Actually, when you compare the difference between the NSA, the prices, and the production, the increase in national income is much higher than that. And that is attributed to the value addition. During early days, we exported our produce from our plantations as raw material, as raw products. But now there is a tendency of adding value and exporting. So here I will identify my first point of in, in, enhancing the uh, contribution of plantation sector to our economy. And it's an important aspect, value addition, value addition. That's the key thing to enhance the uh, economy, the contribution to the national economy. Uh, the NSA means net sale average, the prices, uh, 91, 57 rupees. It had gone up to 580 annually, growing by 33.9%. Even the cost, COP, the cost of production, it has also increased in a similar pattern, similar rate, the NSA and the cost of production. And then what is it for the grower, for the investor, the, the producer? Uh, if we take the 1991 scenario, uh, to produce one kilogram of tea, our cost had been 58 rupees and 41 cents and we had been able to sell it to, to a lower price, lower than the cost of production, 57 
30 by incurring a lost loss. So if we calculate this loss per hectare per year by multi multiplying by the productivity, so it, at this time we have been losing 1,388 rupees per hectare per year in our tea, from our tea. But now under the present day context, uh, we are able to make a margin of about 154,000 rupees per hectare per year. And by the way, I should say that uh, the COP values and the NSA, they are all given in the plantation sector, plantation industries annual report. And the ministry depend uh, on the Department of Census and Statistics for these figures. Annually, they conduct a survey, they select samples of the plantation sector and the smallholder sector, they obtain their data and they calculate the net sale average and the cost of production. So this is comparing these two will give us the direction. So for comparative purposes, these values are valid to, where, to find out where we are heading, the direction of profitability. Right, so currently our land productivity is 1,594 when it comes to T, the national average. But uh, with my experience in the industry, with personal communication with, regard, uh, with the other plantation companies and the, or even the smallholder sector, uh, I feel that very easily we could increase this up to 2,100 kilograms per hectare per annum. 2,100 kilograms per hectare per annum. Now, if we increase it up to 2,100 productivity, which is possible, I am very confident, uh, because of that efficiency, efficiency of, because of high productivity, land, high land productivity and high worker productivity, we can reduce our cost of production to 425. So our net sale average is 580. So by reducing the cost of production to 425, our margin becomes bigger and that into the productivity, expected high productivity of 2,100, our income per year for the producer, for the landowner would be enhanced from 154,000 to 325,000. Simply by increasing the productivity, this is not a, uh, the potential productivity of the crop, but the achievable productivity level. Through agronomic practices, good agricultural practices, we could do this. And how I arrived at the COP figure, uh, I assumed that the cost of production, 50% is fixed cost and 50% is variable cost. And the variable cost will come down because of high productivity. But the fixed cost, I, uh, remain, I took the same value. And based on that, I is estimated this uh, cost of production with high band productivity. So I will come to my next point, enhancing uh, the contribution of the plantation sector to the national economy. Another way, another strategy is to enhance productivity through good agricultural practices. So I have touched on two points here, value addition, enhancing productivity, land productivity. And the other thing, expanding the extent, the extent is coming down. If we can identify suitable land and extend our, extend our, ex, extend our extent under cultivation, that's another way of improving uh, the efficiency of the industry and uh, enhancing the contribution to the country, to the national economy. Okay, so this is the story when it comes to the tea sector. Similarly, we will look into the other sectors as well. We'll move on to the rubber sector. Since I have uh, discussed how I have arrived at these figures, I will not uh, go into that level from now onwards. So if you take the rubber sector, there's a negative growth when it comes to the extent. And even the production 
there is a negative growth, but land productivity, there is a marginal positive growth. The national income from rubber, that's a huge growth. From 1991, which was uh, 2,641 million rupees, and currently it's 147,000 million rupees annually, a growth of 203% annually. And this cannot be explained because by the production and our prices, the prices what we get. This is purely because of value addition, value addition. The rubber industry, the value addition is very, has progressed very much to the extent that we have to import raw rubber from other countries. Our production is 82 million. We are importing about 70 million kilograms of rubber annually to add value in our country. So that's a sad story. So we need to stop that and we should be able to produce our own raw material. So by increasing the production, we can contribute to our economy. Actually, value addition is happening in the rubber sector. Rubber sector. Uh, this productivity, what we are achieving right now, 853, is a rather low figure. The, uh, the institution says it's, it should be much higher than that. But I wouldn't go for that. The institution says that it is about 2,000, what you could achieve. But I have quoted a figure here as 1,400. I know that there are plantation management companies who have achieved 1,400. Large companies, which are managing about four or 5,000 hectares through good agricultural practices. So if we enhance our land productivity to this point through GAP, good agricultural practices, like pointed out before for tea, our cost of production will come down to 164 rupees. And with the NAC of 363 rupees, our profitability to the grower, to the producer, it will increase tremendously from 135,000 to 278,000. So this will benefit the grower as well as the country. So even in the rubber sector, there is potential for improving the uh, contribution to the national economy through enhancing productivity and then very much through enhancing the land extent. Land extent, it is declining. We need to arrest this situation. Now, for this, we have to think out of box. We have been planting rubber in our traditional areas, the width zone of the country, but the Rubber Research Institute has found out that rubber could be uh, introduced into non-traditional areas, uh, the intermediate zone, and there are plenty of ample land, uncultivated land. So the government should uh, develop strategies or encourage the growers, encourage the uh, investors to plant in these areas and expand our rubber cultivation. So that's an area, that are some areas where we could enhance the uh, contribution to the national economy. Moving into coconut, the land extent, it's increasing by about 2.1% annually. It's a commodity highly in demand. It's a food item. See a lot of uh, emphasis on coconut. So the land extent is uh, gradually increasing. The production when comparing with 1991, number of nuts produced about 2 billion, 2.2 billion. Uh, currently it's about 2.6 billion. Again, it shows uh, average growth rate of about 0.7%. Uh, the nuts per hectare per annum, the productivity, however, has declined, has declined from 7,000 to 5,000. Nuts per hectare per annum. So that is something which we should arrest in order to improve the contribution to the uh, national economy. Uh, income to the country, 
from the chocolate industry. It has increased tremendously. And this again comes through value addition. There are so many value added products made from coconut. And that contributes enormously to our uh, national economy. Uh, the, uh, the prices and the cost of production, the increases during this period of time, 1991 to 2018, have been in the same range of 34, 36% annual growth. Uh, under these present trading conditions, the profitability of the grower, the investor, is about 172,000 uh, uh, rupees per hectare per year. But I know this 5,500 nut productivity per hectare per year. This could be increased up to 8,000 with good agricultural practices, good management practices, maybe irrigation where it is needed. And if we enhance up to this 8,000 uh, productivity, thereby we can uh, reduce the cost of production. And with the strength of low cost of production and high productivity, the profitability, profitability to the investor, to the grower could be enhanced. And this is a way of enhancing the contribution to the national economy. So in coconut, there is room for improvement when it comes to the production, productivity, and also value addition. Right, okay, ladies and gentlemen, the traditional props I have touched upon, tea, rubber, coconut, and we find that uh, there is room for improvement in profitability and then contribution to the economy, and we can enhance that. And there is room for improvement through value addition. And then there is room for improvement through expansion of cultivated area. So those are the uh, strategies that are available when you think of the uh, traditional plantation crops. Now, apart from that, Apart from that, uh, uh, these are the some facts which I have identified that could lead to the gaps in productivity and income when comparing with the potential. So I will not go through these things in detail, maybe at the discussion time, why is our productivity low? We can take this matter into discussion. Sure. So what I want to discuss right now about crop diversification, crop diversification. It is another major strategy. The plantation industry in our country could adopt to enhance uh, the contribution of the plantation sector to the national economy. Uh, by not sticking only to the traditional crops, we have to think of other crops which are the demand is continuously increasing and the prices are high. So we have to think of those crops as well. So one such crop I want to discuss, touch upon today is the oil palm crop. Even currently we have, it was, as I said before, this crop was introduced to our country in uh, 1968. So there's a very slow growth Today, if we take the current scenario, we have about 11,500 hectares. So when comparing with other crops, it's a very, very low extent, very low extent. And this is our production, the produce from that. And 11,000 kilograms is the productivity. And with this small extent, the contribution to the national economy is about uh, 7,371 uh, million rupees. The price of the farm gate price of oil palm, the punch is about 70 rupees a kilogram. And the cost of production is 15 rupees. And then we are making about 55 rupees margin on a kilo. That into our productivity will give you the profitability to the grower, which is about 605,000 rupees. So it's a, when comparing with other crops, it's a huge difference. It's a huge increase. 
but this 11,000 productivity is not the potential, not, it's not the potential. You could very easily with good agricultural practices, you could increase up to 16,000. So as I discussed to the other crops, if it is increased up to 16,000, the productivity of a cost of production will come down. Then the profitability per kilo will increase. And as a result, the profitability per hectare per year would be increased up to 917,000 rupees per hectare per annum. So this is another area, crop diversification, where we could adapt to enhance uh, the contribution of the plantation sector to the national economy. And uh, if we expand our oil palm industry or the plantations in our country, we can save about 40 billion rupees an annum because we are not self-sufficient in our oil requirement, vegetable oil requirement. Annually, we import about uh, 220,000 uh, metric tons of palm oil to our country at a cost of 40 billion. So we, if we become self-sufficient, we can save this amount. And that's a huge contribution to our economy, becoming self-sufficient in our vegetable oil. And uh, when it comes to palm oil, we are talking about a crop which is referred to as the most efficient vegetable oil producing crop in the world, in the world. Uh, to emphasize on this fact further, if I say globally, uh, the land extent under crops which are grown to make, obtain vegetable oil, palm oil is just 8.3%, 8.3% of the total land area under oil crops. The production, production of vegetable oil. So that shows the efficiency. 8.3% of land extent contributing to 42.3% of production. It's a very efficient crop. So it's the highest income generating plantation crop in Sri Lanka right at the moment. So this will improve the economic viability of the plantation sector. So with the plantation sector become more economically viable, it will be able to solve the issue of low wages to the plantation workers. And this has the potential to develop, to enhance the livelihood of the poor farmers in our country if we introduce this crop to the small roller sector. And this crop has been used very widely in countries like Malaysia in, and Indonesia as poverty alleviation programs funded by World Bank. So it's a huge potential. But unfortunately, there are so many uh, allegations against this crop saying that this crop is not environmentally sound. The reasons given is that this will not support biodiversity and palm oil will degrade the soil and uh, it will disturb the soil during the cultivation practices. And this is a crop that increase, it has increased use of chemical fertilizer. And by planting palm oil, we are replacing the environment friendly crop rubber. And uh, they are also pointing out the negative impacts recorded in elsewhere in the world, other countries. As a fact, against planting palm oil in other country. Then uh, some social issues that when you plant palm oil, it increases the monkey population which becomes a bother uh, to other people in the villages. And uh, with palm oil, we have introduced a weevil for pollination and some believe that it is harmful. And some say that the bee population in our country has come down because of palm oil. 
And some say that uh, palm oil cultivation, the snake population has increased and the snake bites have increased. And then palm oil will lead to shortage of water and it will lead to shortage of fuel wood and consuming palm oil is carcinogenic. It can lead to heart diseases and also economically it will lead to unemployment. Now these are points put forward by the society, some sectors of the society. And as a result, the government appointed a committee, the government uh, requested Centra, Central Environment Authority to appoint a committee to look into these uh, facts. And based on the uh, outcome of this report, uh, very recently in April, 2021, uh, the government, the current uh, government, uh, stopped palm oil cultivation, further cultivation in our country, saying that it causes soil erosion, it causes drying of uh, water sources, and it affects biodiversity, and all these factors affecting the life of the community. So that's the situation with regard to palm oil, a very profitable crop a crop that has a potential to contribute to the economic development of the country, but uh, this is the decision for that. Uh, just a few pictures about, uh, uh, this is uh, what you can see, there are rubber plantations, both pictures, one at the top, one at the bottom. In one at the top, you will see the soil is eroded, one at the bottom, the soil is very well uh, looked after through a ground cover. So the message I want to give you all, the disturbance to the soil is not a fact depending on the crop, but it is a fact based on the management of the crop. The same crop, if managed differently, it can have adverse impact to the soil, or if you manage it properly, it can have beneficial uh, aspects to the crop. So disturbing soil, soil erosion, soil degradation, you, can, you cannot attribute it to the crop, but it is the style of management. Uh, if you, any crop, if you plant with proper, proper recommended soil and moisture conservation practices, this is a young oil palm plantation. You can see platforms cut, cut terraces cut to uh, prevent soil erosion and water loss, and then cover crop planted to prevent soil erosion and loss of water, a growing of hedge rows. So with these practices, uh, I can't see how this crop will have negative environmental impacts. Here, a young oil palm plantation, you can see how the soil is protected with a legume cover crop. So with these practices, it will have beneficial impacts and not negative impacts to the soil. So a mature palm oil plantation, though some believe that uh, no crop or no species will grow under palm oil, creating a loss of biodiversity, but the truth, the ground reality is different. It supports, it supports biodiversity. Right. So finally, let me say that the plantation sector, the contribution to the national economy could be further strengthened through improvements on, on uh, good agricultural practices and uh, moving towards diversification. I pointed out uh, palm oil uh, just as one example. Cinnamon is another example. It's a very lucrative crop, uh, which has a high demand, a global demand. Then value addition is another aspect. And then increase in the planting extent under these different crops. So these, those are the areas in which we could develop the plantation sector further 
to enhance the contribution to the economy, for which the government, we need the support of the government. And of course, the grower, the investor has to be committed. The government should have firm policies with regard to the wages and with regard to the leasing of the land to the plantation sector, the land acquisition policy they have from time to time they acquire land. So those, are, those have a negative impact on the performance of the plantation companies. And the government should create the enabling, uh, enabling business environment. They should uh, allow the investors to select the most, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the crops which, have, which gives the highest return on investment. And they should uh, provide a, a continuous supply of agrochemicals, fertilizer, other agrochemicals to the plantations. And they need to strengthen the research and development to support the uh, producers or the cultivators, the growers. And then on the other hand, the, gro uh, the growers, the producers, the cultivators, they should make it a point that they adopt good agricultural practices. And then they will change their practices to adopt new technologies. Now, when it comes to harvesting rubber tea, there are new technologies and there is room for improvement in adopting these technologies. And then efficient use of raw materials, especially I'm focusing on coconut, uh, about 70% of our coconut production is used in our households for cooking purposes. And they are, we are not using it efficiently, I am told. Uh, the efficiency of using is just 70%, 30% is wasted. So we should uh, tackle this problem. If we tackle this problem, we can save 30% of the nuts uh, used in household. And that 30% could be diverted into the industrial sector for value addition. So producers can adopt crop diversification with the blessing of the government, uh, cinnamon, palm oil, and various other crops as well. And value addition, tea. You get various tea blends, blends with herbs, which has a huge global demand. And you can make pharmaceutical products out of uh, tea, health drinks, and cosmetic through tea. Those are the novel trends. And with, when it comes to rubber, uh, personal protective equipment, medical appliances, automobile components, electrical components, a vast area of uh, areas for value addition. Uh, when it comes to coconut, coconut milk, cream, powder, virgin coconut oil, we had a very good, very lucrative market, desiccated coconut, and coconut water is fetching a, a good price. And worldwide, there's a growing demand for that. So these are some of the areas where there is potential for value addition. So with that, gentle ladies and gentlemen, let me wind up my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, you gave insight for the plantation sector and the contribution to the economy. Uh, taking many examples, there are a few uh, Questions on the chat box, we will take it up uh, during the Q&A. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I explained, uh, the professor's experience on all the agriculture sector, he very well displayed by sharing his uh, presentation with us. Uh, since the time is also precious, uh, we will now invite our one of our panelists to uh, share his thoughts. We have today with us Director, CEO of National Institute of Plantation Management, Minister of Plantation Industry, Sri Lanka, Dr. Prasad Dharma Sen. Actually, uh, he, NIPM is the one and only training institution dedicated to for the training of plantation uh, sector employees. Now, the difference here is uh, Dr. Prasad represent even the smallholder sector because we are talking about the large plantation under these uh, topic today. Uh, Prasad Dharmasena uh, 
is uh, explanatory re renewed charakta in vital subjects of environment management soil conservation and agroforestry and plantation management with brilliant expertise express knowledge in uh, knowledge spanning over 19 years management having worked in few plantation companies as plantation executive gaining wide experience in agroforestry timber tea cultivation with uh, manufacture etc he was the head of agroforestry and sustainability attached to haley's group of talokale tea estates and kalvini plantation of sri lanka prior to his present position he was in academic staff of rajarata university of sri lanka in the capacity of lecturer and subject coordinator in environmental environment in addition to his super grade uh, accreditations contribution immensely to state universities as a visiting lecturer in environmental conservation and management which we place on record that uh, dr prasad, prasad dharmasena manifested primary experience in the plantations dr dharmasena has completed his phd in agroforestry and regional planning msc in natural resource management at the post graduate of agriculture of university of peradeniya sri lanka was a bachelor degree in environmental management from rajarata university of sri lanka he has actively collaborated intensive and in research and development on facts finding along with researchers agroforestry environment management having extensively contributed towards plantation industry with the um, plantation industry uh, he he is a member of uh, national advisory board of ministry of education of sri lanka and uh, chartered botanist and fellow member of institute of biology in sri lanka uh, we are pleasure to have you dr prasad i would like you to share your thought taking into consideration the presentation made by uh, professor uh, on this subject matter over to you yeah thank you very much and uh, good evening to all uh, first i should thank uh, your prestige association for inviting me as a panelist as professor nugavela comprehensively pointed out there is a huge potentials to enhance plantation contribution to the national economy through productivity enhancement and value addition he also explaining you know covering all these major plantation crop i am really impressed with the statistics and argument uh, professor nugavela developed here to enhance plantation contribution to the national economy but today at present the plantation industry is contributing 28% of agriculture productions to the gdp 28% we will have great potential here. potentials to contribute 10 billion us us dollars to national economy but that is not an overnight assignment it needs well defined plan and policy diversions covering all plantation crops by today tea sector contribute to gdp by approximately by you know 1.5 billion us dollars and rubber it's approximately 750 million us dollars and coconut it is 600 million us dollars and cashew uh, 15 million us dollars and export agriculture sector it contributes uh, nearly uh, 40 to uh, 50 million us dollars and sri lankan consumes uh, nearly 700000 tons of sugar a year is spending 24 million uh, us dollars to import 650000 tons 650000 tons but we only manufacture 50000 tons of sugar in the country 60 to 65000 tons uh, manufacturing we are in the country there are some important initiatives to be implemented in order to in the plantation contribution to gdp it is true that there is a good financial inflow from plantation industry but we have to think that there is some financial outflow also in the industry what we have to do is maximize the financial inflow and minimize the financial outflow uh, in the plantation industry for that as professor nugavella correctly pointed out there are some opportunities as well as challenges what we have to do is we have to maximize the opportunities and minimize the challenges 
uh, I would say that one opportunity as plantation tourism. Professor, I think you also will do agree with me. Plantation tourism, that is, you know, one sector, what we can develop to strengthen uh, GDP. Today, tourism industry contributes to GDP by 12.6%. A research firm called CT Securities, CT Securities, estimates earning from the tourism industry will increase to 5.5 billion US dollars by 2025. This was actually this was estimated in uh, 2018, before the East attack, before the East attack. And uh, 2019, you know, we had the uh, East attack and 20, this uh, COVID, and uh, 21 is also COVID, you know, we don't know how we can achieve this 5.5 uh, billion US dollars by 2025 because of this current uh, scenario. This, uh, the same, uh, this firm also expect that T is one of sector, T is one of sector that we can expand in developing accommodation of accommodation, foods and beverage sales to drive economic growth on the back of government directives to promote tourism sector. He is, you know, one sector. As per the study carried out by Tourism Promotion Bureau, Tourism Promotion Bureau, there are some tourist destinations in the country categorized with the desire of tourists. Nuralia, Bandaraville, Bandaraville, yes, uh, and uh, Muscaria are included for the high country resort region. High country resort region, the total tourist visited in 2018 is 2.3 million and 1.41 million tourists covered Nuralia, Bandaraville, and Muscali region. If not, high country resort region. High country resort region. Now you can imagine the de demand that we have for tea tourism. Actually, not only tea, for the entire plantation industry, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of branch of tourism, which can be called as, you know, plantation tourism. Uh, this kind of, you know, diversifications of the plantation industry can extend the plantation economy, as well as, you know, national economy. And the other that point, what we can, uh, what we, what we can uh, point out is plantation education system. Agriculture and plantation education is more, most important in the country because students learn the way to cater the world trends in agriculture and plantation industry and gain a better understanding of agriculture and plantation management and technology. You are aware that we have 10 agriculture faculties, 10 agriculture faculties uh, in the country. You know, the first agriculture faculty is Peradenia, you know, to other uh, nine agriculture faculties and postgraduate Institute of Agriculture. And we also uh, produce nearly 1,200 agriculture gradu graduates for a year. We do have some uh, agriculture college and uh, institute like you know, National Institute of Plantation Management and other uh, private institute also who over diploma in agriculture or plantation related subject. In addition to these uh, opportunities, uh, higher education opportunities, another 800 to 1,000 students, 800 to 1,000 students, school leavers, are migrating for higher studies in study to some you know, subjects you know, like related to agriculture, environment, and plantation related you know, subjects likewise. Suppose if we can expand agriculture and plantation management openings, just 500 opportunities for local students. Saving just 1 million per head, total saving would be approximately 500 million. Not only from the saving, we also can enroll some foreign you know, persons also uh, who wants to continue their high, either higher studies or so professional educations which are seen in the country. We have recently, this is my experience, uh, we have recently introduced international tea testing program. We felt that there is a huge demand for these programs. My experience with this, uh, with this institute we can earn minimum one billion 
rupees in rupees, not dollars, one million rupees from foreign program. If we introduce, you know, this type of program, I think you know already we have discussed with the plantation ministry and the higher education ministry uh, to introduce you know some degree programs uh, in relation to plantation management and agriculture. If we develop this institute at that level, hopefully we can achieve this target as well. And also all planters and entrepreneurs like Mr. Yajis Silva pointed out like smallholders and other entrepreneurs should periodically update their knowledge on contemporary needs, especially trends. The human capital is the most appreciated asset of any industry. Then only we can maximize our potentials in the existing environment. I know well some of individuals and companies they timely update and equip their staff with the modern knowledge and experience as some professional or as a technical uh, subject experts. Those individuals and companies really perform in the plantation industry, maximizing their contribution to the national production. So education and awareness are most powerful tool in the economic development. And Professor uh, explained you know, very well why diversification is important, especially either land diversification or diversification, product diversifications in the plantation management context. Uh, we have nearly 1 million hectares, even Professor also just told, around 800, 900 hectares with the export agriculture and all these crops. We have nearly 1 million hectares of land, but the report, uh, report says that the land utilization is just 70% of this 1 million land extent. So we can easily diversify this land into profitable ventures, such as, as Professor explained, oil palm, forestry, agroforestry, or other export agricultural crops but we can maximize the pro, uh, profitability of the industry. And value addition, of course, uh, Professor explained it uh, very well. It might be tea, it might be rubber, it might be coconut, cinnamon, or whatever it is, we should develop value addition in order to enhance the industrial pro, uh, profitability. Another one point what I can uh, raise is uh, new market and marketing and promotions. We as a country, we have solid bias destination, you know, such as Russia, UAE, UK, like that. We also should find more buyers from, you know, those are actually traditional countries. Those are traditional countries. We should, you know, find some more buyers from non-traditional countries for even for tea, rubber, and coconut or any other plantation products. Those are actually, I can, uh, refuel as opportunities and challenges of course you know we should address like you know professor explained uh, soil management and ecosystem management likewise we know very well our soil uh, organic matter content of the most of planting districts are just below two percent so we are certainly suffering on uncertainty and annual productivity is also not predictable so the soil management and ecosystem management is also very vital in economic development and climate change. We also should develop a kind of uh, climate smart plantation culture. Another challenge, challenge of course, uh, strengthen the RPCs. Uh, we are really need to enhance the plantation contributes to GDP. We need to strengthen the RPCs also, especially in developing human capital and enhancing new technology with the back of government. And research and development, of course, Professor comprehensively, you know, explain it. Uh, any, any, any industry research and development is very vital and very important. But most of developing countries, they are reluctant to, you know, invest on R&D. But there are a huge potential in the sector to enhance the R&D opportunities. We have good scientists, even in the TRI, RRI, CRI, and uh, sugar research and all, we have good scientists. Uh, so we should invent some possible technologies and modalities rather than just higher technology and you know, knowledge from outside. We should develop a system which is fitted for the local conditions. For the local conditions, then of course we can enhance 
our strength for the national economy. Another, of course, weakness and the kind of challenge we are facing that the institutional gap and the policy implementations. There is no Prasad, strong. Uh, yeah. Excuse, Dr. Prasad, can we? Uh, time is precious. Uh, right, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you. And, uh, the, this is my uh, last point, uh, Mr. Yaji. Yeah. And the thank you. Thank you. And the, uh, policy implications. That also we have to address. Then there is no doubt. Uh, we don't want to, you know, change the policies, you know, time to time. We know that when, when the normal the our country, when uh, one government comes, they also change the policies, and another government comes, you know, they also change the policies. Uh, we should we should have a policy. Policy is the policy. Then definitely, we can enhance our plantation contribute uh, contribution to national economy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Prasad. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, presentation or uh, views. Uh, I mean, you were sharing uh, some different points uh, with regard to how to contribute to the national economy to training and development and human capital, etc. So we'll take it up some of these points at the discussion point. Uh, our next panelist is Mr. Bhatia Bulumulla. He is also well known to the planting at Nadi. He is uh, director CEO of LPA Plantations and he's holding uh, another cap as the chairman of the Planters Association. Planters Association of Ceylon is the apex body who uh, apex body uh, take all these matters relevant to plantation industries with the uh, relevant authorities. Uh, Mr. Bhati Bulumulla uh, serves as a director board of Edkins Transplantation Management and LPA Plantation. He processes over 35 years of experience in the plantation sector out of which for the past 22 years, he is serving at LPDA Plantations PLC. Mr. Bulumola holds a diploma in plantation management from National Institute of Plantation Management and all the BSc Honours degree in plantation management awarded by Vyabha University of Sri Lanka. He also holds a holds MD, MSc degree in environmental science from the Open University of Colombo. That means he's an old boy of uh, uh, our own university. Mr. Bulumola is a fellow member of the National Institute of Plantation Management and member of the board of board of board, board of study of Vibe University external degree program on plantation management. He also an honorary member of boards of rubber research and development board and plantation human development trust. Currently holds the position as I said as a chairman of Planters Association. He has multiple experience, ladies and gentlemen. I now invite uh, Sabati Bulumulla to share his views. Thank you, Yaji. Let me, uh, in the outset, thank you everyone uh, who invited me for this uh, discussion. After listening to Professor Nugavella and Dr. Prasad, I thought I had to change the whole structure what I wanted to talk to you all because they basically uh, uh, brought in about 90% of things what I wanted to tell you all. So let me change the, uh, the, uh, the structure what I wanted to bring it here and give some practical experience with, uh, as Yajit said, I have been in this industry for the last uh, 30 odd years. So I'll bring the practical side of it, you know, how this industry could uh, uh, help the economy of, economy of this country. And also what are the things that we are expecting from the authorities and what things that we can do with the base, asset base that is available with the plantation industry. As you all know, it's correct to, correct to say, we have the largest asset base in Sri Lanka. Uh, you talk about the land asset base, you talk about the human asset base, and also you talk about <clears throat> the capital. So we have all those three amply to invest and bring revenue to this country. To do that, we should have a sound ground uh, us to come and invest in any of these industries. As you all, uh, as Professor very correctly said, in 1992, these plantations were privatized and the shareholders uh, invest their money and purchase this plantation. So anyone who is getting into business, unlike in the government sector, they, they want to have a return. It's a return on investment. 
If you don't want to have a return on investment, you just go and put your capital in a bank. You get five to six percent, and you can be happy. So why are you investing in a, a business, in an agricultural business or any other business for that matter? Because you wanted to get a higher profit than what you are getting from the bank. So that's why the plantation companies too came and invested in the agriculture sector, knowing that there's a huge potential and uh, the private sector is the ideal uh, machinery to harness this potential. As Professor Nukavela said, uh, it's not 2,100 deal that we can achieve. In my company, we have a plantation, one of the largest tea plantation uh, in mid-country. We achieve 3,000 kilograms per hectare yield. The entire plantation, this is not on one field. I'm sure there are so many plantation uh, companies who are achieving over 4,000 yield in certain fields. But uh, estate, the entire estate to achieve 3,000 is remarkable. So those are the, those are the uh, probable targets that we can go. Now, with all this increase of inputs, uh, we face uh, increase of labor wages, as you all know. Uh, and all commodities have gone up. And also, you know, we have a problem of fertilizer right now in our hand. <clears throat> so when you are doing business, if the proper inputs are not given according to the requirement of for that in industry, you can't achieve the desired results. So uh, when you are doing a business, you always want that business to thrive. Otherwise, you know, you shouldn't be in that business. Uh, I don't say that organic fertilizer cannot, you know, uh, sustain this industry. You can, but it's not profitable. Uh, Dr. Nugavilla, Professor Nugavilla will explain very well. Uh, the fertilizer that we were uh, incorporating into soil all these years had 46% nitrogen. Uh, urea, you will have one or two percent, uh, sorry, the organics, you will have more maximum one or two percent of uh, nitrogen. In. So you can imagine the quantum of inorganic that you have to apply to get the same uh, results, at least to get half of the quantity that we require. So that's a cost and the number of labor requirement. Now, why we you know went uh, into various diversification program, Although we had, you know, 200,000 hectares of tea and 127,000 hectares of rubber, due to various uh, uh, newer uh, scenarios that we had to face in the plantation sector, due to outer migration of labor, the labor became a problem. So we have to find innovative methods to keep our industry moving. One way of doing it is mechanization which we have brought in mechanization and also introducing higher uh, yielding cultivars in tea, rubber, uh, and all the other varieties. The next is to go for diversification because you have a big land asset and you know to uh, maximize the uh, unit production of that land asset, you have to diversify it into various crop. This is what the plantation industry has done today. So I will not take very much time and I don't want Yaji to say that time is precious. I will touch upon a few things that we have done in the industry and how we can go forward if we all get together and also the stakeholders of this uh, industry, including the government, help us to do our job properly. Uh, as you all know, the industry required about two and a half labor per hectare per annum and rubber required approximately about 1.25 labor per hectare. So it became a challenge in certain areas, especially in low country, and also for that matter in up country. Uh, due to labor migration, out of migration from the plantation uh, into different uh, odd jobs everywhere, uh, labor became precious. And uh, although we have a huge population on the plantation, we have slightly below 5% of the uh, Sri Lankan population living on plantation sector, but it's about 135,000 people are working on the plantation sector, which was around 250, as doctor said, at the time of uh, privatization. So you can see uh, the quantum of labor that had gone out of the plantation. But at the same time, you see 
our productivity has gone up with the less labor we have managed to increase the productivity that's because all what i told you all in, uh, earlier had been adapted by the plantation companies to increase this productivity so uh, on that aspects we had to you know diversify it into different crops to keep this industry running otherwise there would have been uh, uh, various uh, allegation saying that you know we are not fully utilizing uh, the land base that is given to us um, as dr prasad said some places it 70% you know it's arguable but plantation company start uh, diversifying at that stage into different crop one of the i would say the golden crop that was brought to sri lanka was palm oil uh, like in tea and also uh, in rubber rubber also came from uh, uh, as a forest crop uh, initially came as a commercial crop this too was grown in uh, uh, originally came from jungles you know from uh, african jungles and uh, came to sri lanka and um, we we have slightly above 11000 hectares uh, currently planted uh, uh, in our plantations uh, but if you really compare the other countries that are growing and you know have been successful uh, in this industry malaysia has 32.9 million hectares um, out of which about 6.14 uh, sorry malaysia has 32.9 hectares uh, in agriculture out of which 6.14 hectares in palm oil and indonesia has 12 million hectares in palm oil so we have only 11500 hectares of palm oil with this 11000 we are saving we are saving 7 billion dollars per annum and also if you are allowed to you know increase this uh, the desired con- he- hectare of 20 20000 hectares which was um, decided by scientists to keep the sri lankan requirement of edible oil and fat uh, along with the coconut is requirement is another another 9000 hectares to be cultivated in sri lanka all together to have 20000 if we had this 20000 we could have saved the balance 3 to 4 billion uh, rupees uh, dollars that is going out of the country to bring uh, oil to sri lanka and other crops that we you know also invested in is uh, agarwood cultivation and uh, commercial forestry uh, the horticulture uh, fruits and vegetables in my company itself we have durian ash avocado pineapple banana king coconut in large scale we have gone into this uh, to maximize our productivity of this land and also we brought a revolution into this sri lanka first time in the history of sri lankan plantation we started growing all four berries in sri lanka this is the first time in sri lanka you know that we have strawberries grown everywhere in sri lanka by few growers but not the other berries like raspberries blackberry and blueberries you have never heard even if you want to buy uh, fresh you can still buy it you know you have to buy the frozen stuff in uh, supermarket first time in the history we started cultivating this is the extent that we have got you know we have got the know how from you know european countries uh, we have gone into dead houses newer technology have been brought in uh, pollination uh, growing media uh, fertigation new technology everything have been brought in and we have gone into new new crops to bring this industry forward and also to you know to save lot of foreign currency and i know there are companies who are mastered in spices uh, cinnamon cardamom uh, nutmeg you name it you know various things and they are in the market today if if you really walk in you have you know these products uh, available in the market uh, uh, as plantation crop so these are the opportunities we have in the plantation sector uh, as plantation companies we are always willing to experiment believe in science agriculture is believing in science you don't take a dog decision you don't get up in the morning and think this is good for the country and this is bad for the country all decisions are taken on science based r&d so on that note i will uh, wind up my uh, small uh, uh, contribution to this uh, discussion i only request one request from the government or the authorities please have consistent in their policies then only you know 
plantation companies can bring more than what they are expecting into this country. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Bharia. Uh, I know the time is precious, but you have so many things to share with us. Uh, we'll now move into the Q&A. Uh, there's a question to Professor. Professor, how do you define palm oil as a vegetable oil? And also, in the same uh, question, there's another question to compare the water consumption of the uh, different crops. If you can share it, that will be great whether palm oil could be considered as a vegetable oil and water consumption. Yeah, thank you, Ajit, for that question. Uh, definitely now, if you take oils, uh, uh, you get uh, animal fat and then vegetable fat. So a produce that comes from plant, it's a production, produce, something produced from a plant. Palm oil comes from the oil palm plant. So it's a vegetable oil. I mean, though we say vegetable oil, it doesn't mean that uh, we extract the oil from vegetables like uh, carrots, uh, cabbages and all that. No, it's not that. Uh, uh, oil that is obtained from a plant, it's referred to as a vegetable oil against animal fat. Now, we know, now when, uh, when we were small in milk powder, we saw that uh, as an additive for fat, they had used animal fat previously, long years ago. And then there were uh, protests against that, some didn't like it. So now it's made out of, uh, the addition is done by vegetable oil. So you get animal fat as well, but not uh, very popularly, popularly used in our food industry right now. So first of all, yes, palm oil is a vegetable oil. Uh, now about the water use. Now, now, water use of a crop or a plant species. Now, if you take the plantation crops like uh, uh, rubber, palm oil tea, uh, there are a lot of scientific research done on the, the water use of uh, different plantation crops. And uh, you measure it by measuring the, uh, what you call the evapotranspiration, evapotranspiration. And if I say, uh, the water use of plantation crops, like uh, it is highest in palm oil, but the difference, the no, it's, it's highest in tea. The highest water use comes from tea, then from palm oil, then rubber, and then coconut. So, but the difference between different crops are not that great, not that great. Now, if I, for example, uh, in oil palm, it's about uh, 1,300 millimeters of water per annum. And when it comes to rubber, it's about 1,150, 1,200. So a difference of about 100 millimeters per annum. But when it comes to tea, it's much higher than that. Now, again, now these figures, various scientists have done these experiments under different climatic conditions. So if you measure the water use under different climatic conditions, you get different values. So uh, some may compare uh, different crops based on the scientific evidence, but from different environments so that we cannot do. You have to do the compare and co comparing and contrasting under similar conditions. So Yajit, uh, my a very short answer to your question, uh, yes, uh, we have studied water use in different plantation crops. Uh, highest we find it in tea and then palm oil, then rubber, then coconut in that uh, order. Uh, but the differences between, uh, there's a, a debate about the water use of palm oil. It's only very marginally higher than in uh, rubber. But uh, as, as I said before, the uh, usage is 1,300 millimeters per annum but we cultivate this palm in areas where we receive about uh, 3,500 to 4,500 millimeters of rainfall. Have I answered you your Professor. question, Yajit? Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. There's another question to you on the same subject. Yeah. Uh, why are you advertising palm oil instead of coconut oil? Is it benefit, uh, benefit compared with health of people? Why are yeah. you hiding that fact? This is an open question. I think even Bhatia okay. or Dr. Professor, you can 
give a, give your views why once again i'll repeat it why are you advertising palm oil instead of coconut oil is it benefit ah, right. benefit compared with health of people right so uh, basically now if we take the uses of uh, oil coconut oil palm oil uh, now palm oil is not only used for cooking purposes it's uh, used in very many industries very many industries and uh, mainly in the food industry and there are quite a lot of food food products that needs palm oil for its production for its manufacture you cannot do it with uh, coconut oil palm oil is a must and there are so many such industries in our country so if there is no palm oil those industries will not be able to progress they will not be able to uh, manufacture their product so palm oil is a must in certain products and that cannot be substituted with coconut oil so that is one thing and then when it come to the health aspects now for example yes palm oil is used as for vegetable oil uh, coconut is also used as a vegetable oil so when you when it comes to the health aspects uh, there are many things which you need to consider now coconut oil is more a saturated oil now there is a belief that saturated oil will lead to uh, building up of higher cholesterol levels now palm oil has lesser amount of saturated oil it's only 50% whereas in coconut oil is 90% so if if saturated oil causes heart ailments then coconut oil is bad and palm oil is good that's one area the other thing is uh, in vegetable oils the the fatty acids you get certain fatty acids which are saturated and certain fatty acids which are unsaturated now when you uh, use an oil for repeated use like like coconut oil if you use it repeated for cooking if you uh, uh, bring the oil to high temperature many times uh, coconut oil is more stable because it is not unsaturated but palm oil is a unsaturated oil it has double bonds so if you repeatedly heat it uh, the double bonds can break and then it can lead to several other uh, uh what do you can say uh, products or uh, um, compounds uh, chemical compounds so in that aspect uh, coconut oil is better than palm oil because palm oil is more saturated it's more stable you can use it for repeated cooking but palm oil unsaturated more unsaturated oil when you repeatedly heat the, the, the double bonds break and it can lead to various unhealthy chemical compounds so that's another aspect and then uh, you get uh, various other carcinogenic material like now the recently there was a talk about aflatoxins aflatoxins is made out of it's uh, it's given to the oil by a fungus called aspergillus now that is present in coconut oil but it is not present in uh, uh, palm oil so there you get advantages and disadvantages and then uh, even in palm oil there are certain chemical compounds like uh, mcpds you call it mcpds you get that in more amount in palm oil but lesser amount in coconut oil so there are pros and cons in both types of vegetable oils and palm oils but we will be need to be mindful when we are really using it Dr. so i am not in palm oil but uh, what i say is that it is a need in the country to support certain industries whether we produce palm oil in our country or not palm oil is needed if we don't produce it the country will have to import it if the country is importing it country will have to spend enormous amount of foreign exchange so my argument is why we spend our valuable foreign exchange on a produce that we can produce in our own country uh, professor just to add into that yeah and also there's no argument between coconut oil and palm oil whatsoever it's yeah. only you know we are talking about bridging the gap we have mm -hmm. a shortfall of requirement of uh, fats and oil in this country so the fastest and easiest uh, uh, 
oil that could fill this gap is palm oil. Uh, yeah. As you all know, coconut will take seven, five to seven years to uh, harvest once it's planted. But palm oil start, you know, giving your crop in three and a half years. And also, the main important aspect, palm oil can give four and a half times more yield in uh, oil compared to coconut. When coconut gives only one ton per hectare, uh, palm oil can give four and a half tons per hectare. So your requirement of extent, you know, to get the requirement of edible oil is less compared to, you know, four and a half times less compared to planting coconut. And also, as you all know, uh, in Sri Lanka, although you find coconut everywhere uh, in the country, the most productive coconut is in the coconut triangle. Uh, the other areas, you don't get the correct yields that you get. So we are short of land. So the best solution for this uh, shortage, as doctor said, you know, if you want, we have a problem is dollars right now. We all know only way to, you know, to safeguard these dollars and to improve our uh, cash inflow is to, you know, to bridge this gap with palm oil. Thank you, Bhatia. Thank you, Professor. Bhatia, there is a question for you uh, from uh, one of our members. If you have a land of 40 purchase, can we go for palm crop and sell the fruit as a commercial product? If yes, this may be good uh, alternative as commercial crop for small land footprint against the coconut palms. Will you please uh, share your thoughts on that? That I think question is whether we can sell the fruits uh, if you produce palm oil and then other, other, other plots could be commercially planted with uh, coconut oil. Coconut, sorry, coconut palms. There's, there's no problem of selling fruit because we have, to, we have two mills in Sri Lanka and both are running under capacity. So any quantity, you know, it's a concept that we should develop in Sri Lanka actually to uh, have more smallholders coming into this sector. Then, you know, all this myth that is, you know, rally around this crop will be eliminated. So it's a good, you know, you know 40 acres, you know, for, sorry, 40 perches. I'm sure you can have, you know, a few plants in that. And uh, I would like to mention, you know, we are willing, the plantation companies are willing to give you free plants. These plants are not coming easy to this country. Uh, by, uh, uh, we don't have any seeds production in the Sri Lanka and we don't have the mother palms. We bring this from either Malaysia or Indonesia or Papua New Guinea. By the time a, a seed lands in Sri Lanka, it becomes about one and a half dollars now, a seed alone. So plant cost will be slightly high, about, about 700 to 800 rupees by the time it's ready to go into the but we are willing to give a free plant to anyone who is interested in planting in any of these smallholder uh, uh, plots. Thank you, Bhatia. Our time is very precious. Of course, there are so many questions. I have another question for uh, Dr. Prasad Dharmasena. It is a known fact that a country should uh, be self-sufficient in food production in order to prevent cash outflows and not depend on imports. I mean, we just discussed about it, uh, Dr. Prasad, with your... Uh, uh, with your experience uh, in the agroclimate conditions, uh, the uh, how uh, we could uh, encourage the uh, stakeholders to improve their productivity uh, to enhance the income and the land productivity. What do you, Dr. Prasad? It's in uh, food production concern. Yep. It's a question to you. Sorry, I couldn't hear, get you. Can you repeat, Can I repeat it? it? Yeah, sure, sure. It is actually what the question is that the country should be self-sufficient in its all production to prevent cash outflow and foreign income, foreign currency going out in a, in a nutshell. And with a, this uh, good agro agroclimatic conditions in Sri Lanka, the farmer should be encouraged to cultivate suitable products to enhance income and land productivity. Your observation and comments, please. Yeah, that of course, uh, food production uh, concern, as I explained, you know, uh, education concern, it is very important. Because uh, since our experience, we know uh, these farmers, especially, you know, farmers, uh, they don't have, you know, uh, really that, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, agroclimatic conditions, as well as some, uh, especially rainfall patterns and the monsoons and you know this type of things concern so education is very important number one the second one is you know we also should you know 
develop sort of you know good materials for the you know small holders and you know planters like that thank you thank you thank you yeah. uh, doctor uh, there is another question to uh, again mr bathia bulumulla this is about the uh, environment factor again there is a perception of some local communities that the uh, crop diversification affect the uh, rainfall and as a result the i mean in the plantation area the water springs are drying out bathia with your experience in the low current plantation you would have been in the plantation sector for many years would you like to comment on that yes yeah ji i think it's another mithya ji you know there's no truth in that as doctor very correctly said uh, since we started if you go through the rainfall pattern of the area what we have planted palm oil uh, areas where we have gone into major crop diversification for that matter the rainfall has tremendously uh, increased now our plantation company has plantation in all three elevation in up country mid country and low country so i have been constantly you know evaluating the rainfall patterns of all these three region uh, it's uh, sorry to say this you know wrong information is been published by various interested parties i would say interested parties i will come to that later uh, mainly because you know they have such a vested interest uh in low country the rainfall which is around 2500 to 2700 have gone about 3500 mm 3500 mm is you know you get uh for every meter uh, every meter of land um uh, that is uh, sorry um, one liter into every 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 meter of land so uh, you have uh, uh, in hectare you have 10000 uh, 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 sorry 1000 uh, square meters so you you get i'm sorry you know you get 10000 square meters and you get uh, 3 million uh, liters of water in in low country especially up country especially in rural area you all know now the rainfall has gradually gone down which is around 2500 rainfall last year it has gone to 1900 and mid country it's it's around 1005 to 1008 so you see the air non areas non oil palm area the rainfall is going down and this is a forest there's no reason the rainfall to go down although uh, it takes you know water um, if you really do a calculation the water fall that occurs into that area is enough you know to you know for about two years one year rainfall is enough for more than two years so there's no shortage of water and also we should forget the other factors that is contributing for this dryness or water shortage there are you know excess of for forest clearance and um, de demining these and mining of this uh, the rivers and you know take the water table down and various other activities done by various parties affecting this you know it's uh, very unfair to say that you know oil palm or the uh, uh, crop that we are diversified you know is taking this uh, situation various other situation so as i told you know in other areas where we don't have oil palm it rainfall has gone down drastically no really is no more you know rainy area it's a dry 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 area we are experiencing that thank you thank you uh, uh bathia there is a last uh, of course there are so many questions but i have one question because we are running out of time uh, it's a professor professor now as per the famous statement the wet area is going to be wetter and the dry area is going to be drier under such circumstances um, what do you think about this diversification strategy i would like to have your answer in a short form because almost we are come to the end of the session yeah i mean uh, your observation is correct uh, wet wet areas are getting wetter and when it comes to the rubber crop uh, the rubber crop is badly affected by uh, wet weather especially harvesting of part of it uh, so uh, yes we need to uh, rethink about where we cultivate where we put our crops the we have to identify the most suitable areas 
depending on the current climatic conditions. Now, as I said before, the rubber research has identified uh, marginal areas, previously marginal areas, the intermediate zone of the country as suitable for rubber. So I think that uh, shifting our rubber crop to our intermediate areas where there is ample amount of land uh, will helpful to the grower, to the investor, and to improve the production in our uh, rubber production in our country. Yes. We'll Thank you very much, Professor. Crops. Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the session. Uh, we had a very productive session today. And um, on behalf of uh, the organizing committee, so there's a lot, lot of thank. I'm, we are very fortunate to have this eminent personnel participate in this uh, webinar today. Actually, it's a very wide subject. That is why some of the questions we are unable to uh, uh, pose to the uh, resource personnel. Uh, once again, um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for actively participating and posing a lot of questions. So let's see whether we can share our thoughts with you even after this uh, session. And we will we have your information. We'll try to give some of the answers. With that, I will wind up the um, session uh, webinar proper. I invite our energetic uh, secretary, Mr. Indika, who did so much of work behind the scene to make this event a success, not only this event, all the events, to deliver the water tanks. It's over to you, Indika. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yajit. Very good evening to all. It's given me an immense pleasure to deliver the water of tanks at this important event to all dignitaries assembled. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank Professor V. Sivologa Dasan, Dean, Faculty of Management Studies, and Professor Nani Nabesekar, Head Department of Marketing Management, encourage and guidance to us. Uh, next, our uh, guest of honor, Dr. Champika Lienakamage, uh, Course Coordinator, Sempa Sempa uh, Program and senior lecturer, faculty of management studies, uh, who honored this webinar despite her inspirational thoughts. We are grateful to Emirate Professor Asoka Nugavela for his present and this occasion and extending his kind cooperation and wonderful presentation to make into event success. And we also like to acknowledge our gratitude, Mr. Bhatia uh, Bulumulla, Director, the Chief Executive Officer, LPTA Plantation PLC, for his contribution to make this event success. Next, I would like to thank Dr. Prasad Tarmasena, Director and CEO of National Institute of Plantation Management, for his fine cooperation and sharing valuable thoughts at this event. And also Semba Semba Alumni Association Executive Committee for the untiring effort to make this event a success. Thank you all heartedly. Last but not the least for the participants for making this webinar as a grand success. Semba Semba Alumni Association is planning to conduct webinars for the benefits of our memberships and other interested personals on all three major languages and different themes. If you wish to participate in our webinars, you may join with us through our Facebook page or our uh, YouTube channel visiting our recaps, events conduct, uh, Semba Semba Alumni Association, Sri Lanka. Once again, I thank one and all present today. Thank you. Yeah, Indika, thank you very much, Indika. Actually, I couldn't uh, share with the, our uh, resource personnel. There were some um, interesting comments made by very experienced planters who have joined and the academics. Uh, we saw a foreign person also was joining this uh, uh, webinar as well as uh, some of the scientists. And thank you very much. Uh, to make this event a success. I always believe every end is a new beginning. So let's uh, communicate on these lines what we discuss about and we expect you to join our next webinar. We are planning to 
have it in on the 17th of november thank you very much good night have a pleasant evening thank you thank you everyone thank you.